302, I'm Jackie Ferris. On this week's show, we're going from the battlefront to the home front as we visit the historic Cooch Homestead. We're going to learn all about the battle at Cooch's Bridge and what's being done to take care of this place for generations to come. Get ready to go back in time. The 302 is taking you there. Hey 302, if you are a history buff, especially dealing with the Revolutionary War, then you may have heard of the battle at Cooch's Bridge. We are now at the Cooch Homestead in Newark, Delaware, to talk a little bit about the rich history of this place. I'm joined by Wade Katz. He is a historian and an archaeologist, all wrapped in one, and he's going to tell us all about the rich history here. Wade, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Jackie. Nice to be here. Now, a lot of folks may or may not know about the significance of this place in terms of the Revolutionary War. Talk to us about how the battle started um, at the bridge, at Cooch's Bridge. Okay. Uh, the, the battle here was fought on the 3rd of September, 1777. It's part of the Philadelphia campaign of the uh, uh, Crown forces or the British forces uh, landing at the Head of Elk, which is down the road behind me to the west. Um, or in that vicinity and coming towards Philadelphia, trying to capture Philadelphia. The battle is fought between an American light infantry formation and the lead elements of the British Army, uh, which uh, all total are uh, probably a couple thousand soldiers who fight here. The fighting actually finishes around the house and the bridge. Uh, it starts down today, what is now around the village of Glasgow, Delaware, what at that time was called Aiken's Tavern and it's fought in a series of delaying actions by the American Light Infantry who try to slow down the British advance, recognizing that they can't prevent the entire British Army of about 15, 17,000 men from advancing on this space. The last phase of fighting is right at the bridge, and American forces take a position on the far side of the creek, on the east side of the creek. British forces are on this side of the creek and moving towards the bridge. The American forces, uh, after hand-to-hand -hand combat and firing themselves out of ammunition, exhausting their ammunition supply, are eventually driven from the field um, after also the English bring uh, artillery pieces to bear as well. So small cannons are involved. Uh, the forces that fight here are principally driven on the Crown Forces side by Hessian infantry, known as Jaegers. Uh, they are trained to fight in open order and uh, armed with rifles and small short swords. So instead of bayonets, they carry swords. And the American forces that fight here are the uh, American Light Infantry Corps that had only been formed about a week before the battle and consisted of men that came from the Continental Regiments that came from North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, and New Jersey. Delaware militia fought here, so Delaware militia from Newcastle County were here and so also were militiamen from the western counties of Pennsylvania. In addition to Chester County and Bucks County, well, Chester County for sure, there were definitely uh, militia who came out of Lancaster County and York County that fought here as well. Um, the American force that fought here was both musket armed and rifle armed, um, and that was the attempt to try to have a combined arms force of light infantry that fought here. Their commanding officer was a man named William Maxwell, who was a Brigadier General from New Jersey. But we know a lot about the other soldiers that fought here as well, principally through their pension record information, muster roll information, uh, and also from some of the, there really are no first person accounts of who actually fought here. But from those other sources of information, we can get data on who these people are. So we know uh, the future Chief Justice John Marshall fought here at Peaches Bridge, so he's a Virginia officer who is here. Uh, a Virginia officer named William Heath fought here. He had been actually in the service and wounded in Quebec two years earlier. He had been wounded and captured at the attack on Quebec, wounded in the face, came back into the service, fought for the Continentals, and was here. Uh, another officer who loses his life down in Charleston in the 1780s uh, was a, a Richard Parker, was another Virginia officer who was here. 
a man who goes on to be a founder of um, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson College. Uh, uh, Francis Gurney was a Philadelphia merchant and was a major in a Pennsylvania regiment. A man who goes on to be the governor of um, uh, North Carolina, Alexander Martin, was here and fought with the North Carolina Continentals. And then uh, another officer, a young man, a lieutenant at the time, uh, goes on, a man named Derek Lane from New Jersey, goes on to be a founder of, of the town of Rensselaer in New York. So little by little, we're gaining information about who the officer corps was that was here. And um, it's, a, it's a remarkable story because of the people that you know that were here. We also know that somewhere on this battlefield are probably about two dozen or so uh, American dead that were buried on the field by the British after they won the battle. They, they were responsible for cleaning up the battlefield. And you've also found a lot of artifacts like musket balls in, throughout the area, right? Uh, a archaeological survey was done on the property at one point and recovered musket balls, uh, buckles, buttons, things that are, that are part of a battlefield or that would be part of an encampment that happens after the battle. Uh, I would hasten to add that these are protected lands. We're standing on state-owned property right now. There is no metal detection allowed, and we're also, uh, the lands that surround us are privately owned, and no metal detection is allowed on those. Uh, so there, it's important that we keep that record in the ground and protect that record. Uh, the family over the centuries that they have lived here have actually found musket balls, cannonballs, and other objects uh, that shows up in newspaper articles and things uh, from 100 years ago that they'll talk about a musket that they found or a cannonball that they found. Um, but archaeological survey has clearly identified that the battlefield is still here and still intact, and it's still out there in the spaces around us. And it extends for quite some way all the way over to the house, and we're going to talk about the house when we come back. I am Dan with Fearless Improv, and you are laughing with the three, two, two. Welcome back. We are on the Cooch Homestead, and we're talking a little bit about the rich history here. We talked about the battle at Cooch's Bridge. Now we're going to talk about the house. I'm joined by historian and archaeologist Wade Katz. Now, Wade, this house built in 1760 was once, during the battle, was occupied by the British. Is that right? That's right. Uh, the house was occupied by the British for five days after the battle, so that the battle is fought on the 3rd of September. The British Army occupies this whole area, so uh, to my right is Iron Hill. They, their battle line extended from Iron Hill all the way down to the village of Glasgow, Delaware. Um, Corn Lord Cornwallis was the general who lived in the house. Uh, the tradition is, or the story is, that he quartered his horses in the first floor of the house that you see behind me. Um, prior to him being here, though, the American general, Maxwell, also used the house as his headquarters. So the American forces, that light infantry corps, were occupying this house as well. So the house kind of went through both sides of the, of the, of the armies as they, as they came through. Uh, the house as you see it now is a, 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 a accreted house. It's been built onto over time. Uh, the, the section to my left is the, is the 1760 section. Uh, it had a third floor added to it in uh, about a century after that in the 1860s. Uh, the section to my right is an 1820s component and then at the far end of that is the kitchen, which seems to suggest based on the architectural evidence that that may have been the original house that when the Kuchs come to the area in the 1740s, 1746, they may have been living in that building before they built the 1760s house at the front of the house, or the front of the front of the property as we see it now. Um, there was a mill on the property, which is why the Kuchs came to the area. They were millers. The mill was on the, on the creek, the Christina Creek, which is down below us. Uh, when the British left the spot here, they burned that mill down. It was kind of what they did, that you kind of like destroy as you go so that your, your enemy can't use that resource again? Um, yeah, they actually used the mill to supply their army, and then the day they left, they burned the structure. There are other mills in the region, and as they, as they advanced to, uh, from here, they went to the Battle of, at Brandywine. That was the next major engagement that occurs. Um, 
they they do loot and remove uh, kind of pillage and take things from families and houses as they go up the road that way. So after the battle, what happened to the house? Uh, the house stays in, in the family uh, and has been in the family for multiple generations. Um, the, the, uh, the, the additions to the house that you see were added by Cooch members at, at various times. So the, the addition to the rear to my right is William Cooch in the 1820s. The 1860s edition is probably uh, J. Wilkins Cooch, who is also responsible for the placement of the monument down by Old Baltimore Pike, and prior to that, for the placement of a large flagpole in the yard off to my left. So with all of this history uh, springing up around them from the battle and going forward, did uh, any members of the Cooch family fight in the Revolutionary War? Uh, yes, actually, the member who builds the 1820 edition was a teenager during the war and seems to have enlisted in, the, in a uh, privateer soon after the battle was fought here. The Cooch family themselves were not here at the time of the battle. Like many, many Delawareans and people in Pennsylvania, they got out of the way of the armies as the armies were advancing. Uh, but the elder Cooch, uh, uh, Thomas Cooch, the, the one who builds the house in the 1760s, he was a colonel in the Newcastle County Militia. So it was not a wise idea for him to be on site here as the British Army is marching through. Um, the displacement and movement of people in prior to the battles being fought here or at Brandywine is pretty remarkable and a lot of information that is in, the, is in documents that, that people need to be looking at. There, there's a lot more effect than just watching armies march up and down the roads. Um, it affects the civilian population considerably. So in your research, you looked over um, Cooch family documents to, to, to figure out who was here and, and the different phases of the house. And The Cooches have a remarkable archive, family archive, that has a lot of material uh, that's available to be learned about the history of this property. Uh, photographs of the property over time and how it's changed beginning in the, in the mid 19th century. They have photographs that follow the history of the property. Uh, the, the history of their, their own interest in the battle. Uh, the only book right now that's written about the battle was written by um, uh, Edward Cooch Sr. Uh, and he served as a lieutenant governor for the state of Delaware for a short period of time. But he, was, he is the author of a book on the Battle of Cooch's Bridge published in 1940. Now the memorial that you, you talked about uh, went in in the 1900s? The memorial was erected in 1901 and is, uh, a, uh, was placed by uh, the patriotic societies in Delaware. So the, society, the sons and daughters of the American Revolution, um, they uh, helped raise the funds to put that monument up. It's just amazing, you know, that you know so much about something that happened so long ago, but there's such a great interest in what happened here at Cooch's Bridge. Do you, do you find, I know the bridge is not here anymore though, right? There is a bridge here. The bridge that was here at the time is not the bridge that is still in existence, but that bridge has been replaced uh, by the highway department multiple times. It was probably a wooden structure of some kind at the time of the battle. By the 1880s, it's an iron pony truss bridge. By the 1920s, it's the bridge that you see there now. Prior to the pony truss bridge, it seems to have been a covered bridge. Mm -hmm. A lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, versions of, of the original. Right. Right. Excellent. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Wade, for sharing all of this with us. We certainly appreciate You're it. You're very welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll be right back. My name is Jeff Nodner. I'm the pianist with the Cartoon Christmas Trio, and I'm jamming on the 302 with me and you. Welcome back. We're talking about all of the history here at the Cooch Homestead and what a big responsibility it must be to preserve it. We're joined now by Tim Slavin. He is the director of the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs for the state of Delaware. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jackie. Now you just got this property, a very expansive property with several buildings a couple of years ago. It must be such a responsibility to kind of, you know, preserve this for generations to come. We are, uh, we're so honored to be a part of the history of this, this property. Uh, first, the Cooch family has had a long history involved with ethical stewardship of not just the, 
houses that you're seeing and the structures that you're seeing, but the lands and all of the resources that are there. And now working with them, they've passed that responsibility on to our division, my colleagues, and we're just so excited about this opportunity. This is the newest historic site that we've brought into our fold. We have a campus of properties that runs from the northernmost part of the state up in Claymont, all the way down to Fenwick Island in Delaware. It's 43 properties. It includes all kinds of things like jail cells and schoolhouses and churches and lighthouses. And now we have this, just this wonderful historic resource available to us. So what, what does it take to, to keep something like this going? I know now you do private events, but down the road, are you thinking about once you have everything squared away that you might have exhibits and things like that to really kind of connect with the community? Yeah, what we want to do is engage with the community and give them a place where they feel welcome, where they feel they can learn and they can come to have better understanding of their surroundings and their own community. The history speaks for itself here, but we still need to speak for it, right? We still need to tell those stories. And if you think about this property where we're standing, we're in the middle of a 10 acre parcel that we own. There are other lands around us that are protected. We have open space in an area that really wants and needs open space, right? We have I-95 nearby and Route 72. So this is a place where people can come and find respite, they can find learning, education. Our vision for the property is that this would be a full-scale historic site where people could have a variety of activities. They could attend lectures, they could see exhibits, they could simply walk, uh, they could bird watch. Uh, we have really kind of a much bigger vision than we have the money for right now, but we're in this for the long haul. Right? We own this property uh, over in perpetuity and we will develop it slowly and bring in the community as we, as we can. No, I would imagine the first order of business is taking care of capital projects for, for the Cooch House. Is there something that you guys have on your wish list or that you're, you know, you're putting into next year's budget or maybe you're fundraising for to preserve the house? Yeah, we just initiated a Friends of Cooch's Bridge organization, a private nonprofit um, entity that will help us and they're just kind of getting started with their work now, so they will help us to attract private funding. I should tell you that the private-public partnership started long before that. The purchase of this property was done in part with state money, but also with private money as well. We were able to attract funding from the Marmot Foundation and the Crystal, Foundation, Crystal Trust to fund, fund this purchase. You know, our wish list is we want to get everything done, right? We want to get everything back up to, to usable and, uh, and used for a different purpose. It's a slightly different reuse than it was as a home to invite people in to take tours and things like that. We also have this amazing resource with the land all around us. This is just an extraordinary uh, resource for us to be able to develop and invite people into it. Now I know that for a house that was built in uh, 1760, it's in pretty good shape. I mean, I see some cracks and things, and I'm sure that there are some upgrades that you want to do, but it seems like you're starting off in a good place. Yeah, the, you know, we, we come in, first thing we do, we come in and we assess what the existing conditions are immediately that we've found. And by and large, you know, we, we have, as I say, it has good bones, right? It has good bones, it's, it's a good building, and now we have to kind of lay in what we want to do as far as kind of the new systems that we have to bring in for things that are just, you know, heating and air conditioning and bathrooms and things like that. And then we look at what modern amenities we have to introduce to the property that may be outside of a historic structure. How do we park people? How do we move people around? These are all things that we're, we're eager to get started on and, and, and hungry for the opportunity. I know there are a lot of folks out there who are huge Revolutionary War buffs, who love to visit sites like this, and also contribute money, time, etc. If somebody wants to help you in your mission, maybe not just with uh, you know, the Cooch Homestead, but somewhere else um, historically in Delaware, how do they do that? Sure, easiest place is go to our website, history.delaware.gov and kind of take a look at what our holdings are, what all the activities are that we're involved because we're involved in more than just managing the properties that we own. We have historic preservation activities all over the state. We have a very active volunteer program. We invite people to come in. If they want to be a volunteer for a day, 
for an afternoon, we can tailor an experience for them that's meaningful for them and meaningful for us as well. And you don't necessarily have to know the history top to bottom because that's part of the process of, that's part of the beauty of being a volunteer is that you learn as you go a lot of the time, right? That's right. And the one thing I love is when someone comes to a site and says, I never knew this site existed or I never knew about this because we have clearly made a difference. Even if it's that much, we've made a difference in what we've done. Well, it's certainly clear that you guys are making a difference here in preserving this historic site. And I know a lot of people are going to be counting the days until they can come and enjoy some of the program. One more time, if you can give us the website. Sure, the website is history.delaware.gov. And if you want to reach us by phone, it's 302-736-7400. Tim, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be right back. That'll do it for this week's episode. We leave you now with some beautiful aerial shots of the Cooch homestead. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. We'll see you on the 302.